Welcome to the first day of the rest of Donald Trump's presidency. Most of us still digesting the Mueller report, a 400 plus page account of an elaborate and successful Russian election meddling campaign that sought to boost Donald Trump, as well as a detailed accounting of Donald Trump's robust pattern of obstructive conduct. It was conduct so troubling that the special counsel could not and would not say that crimes had not occurred. The bottom line from a Trump ally and a witness in the Mueller investigation, who I spoke to by phone this morning, quote, the Mueller report paints a classic portrait of Donald Trump and details how his impulsivity can lead to his criminal conduct. This witness also singling out Republicans for criticism today for ignoring the Mueller report's Russia findings so far. One thing is clear, though, Donald Trump's thuggish, thuggish behavior will continue and perhaps accelerate. Today, he identified a new enemy, note takers. The president tweeting this morning, quote, watch out for people that take so-called notes. <laughs> a reference to a devastating portrait of the president painted by his former White House counsel, Don McGahn. That portrait and the testimony of many other aides close to the president leading to coverage like this from today's New York Times. The White House that emerges from more than 400 pages of Mr. Mueller's report is a hotbed of conflict infused by a culture of dishonesty, defined by a president who lies to the public and his own staff, then tries to get his aides to lie for him. Mr. Trump repeatedly threatened to fire lieutenants who did not carry out his wishes while they repeatedly threatened to resign rather than cross lines of propriety or law. And the Washington Post reports, quote, Mueller's report is singular for its definitive examination of the events and will not easily be dismissed by Trump and his aides as fake news. The main actors are under oath and on the record, and the narrative they laid bare stands as an historical product. And that is where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance is at the table, along with MSNBC political analyst Rick Stengel, a former Time Magazine managing editor, NBC and MSNBC national affairs analyst John Heilman's back, and our friend Donnie Deutsch is at the table. We're going to move the camera off those two misfits in Washington, two of the best reporters on on the beat. They've been following this investigation and this White House from the beginning. New York Times Chief White House Correspondent Peter Baker and Carol Lennig, National Investigative Reporter for The Washington Post. First to you, Peter and Carol, and to your newspapers. The front pages, I, 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 I thought of offering to frame them and deliver them to the museum myself this morning. Just, I think if, for those of us who were, who were, you were covering this all day, I was on TV all day, it didn't hit me until I opened my door and saw your front pages just how seismic this shift was in terms of what we now know took place in the 2016 election on the part of the Russians and the unwitting, perhaps, uh, conduct of, of, of Trump and his campaign and the efforts to obstruct the investigation. Peter, let me let me start with you and, and, and your unbelievable story that you and, and I believe your colleague Maggie Haberman wrote for today's paper. Yeah, look, you know, in fact, it's a story that his own aides tell. That's what's really remarkable about this Mueller report. Uh, the portrait that emerges of this president of this White House comes from the people he chose to surround himself with. People like Don McGahn, people like, uh, uh, you know, Rob Porter, people like, uh, uh, you know, Reince Priebus and Corey Lewandowski and Chris Christie. These are people who told stories about... Uh, what happened in these first couple years of the presidency that are today being dissected by us and by the public at large uh, as we evaluate, you know, what kind of picture we get. And what we get is a picture of chaos. We get a picture of conflict. And we get a picture of, honestly, uh, you know, a pretty <clears throat> dishonest uh, culture where the president does, as you wrote, as you read, uh, lie about his own actions and tell his aides to lie to the public. Carol, as an investigative reporter, and, and, and we're going to dive into the report with, with both of you, because it's the first time I've had to, to talk to either one of you, but, but just, just as an investigative reporter, who, and, and having been a White House communications director, I know you, we didn't always welcome your calls, but when they came in, we tried to respond honestly within the boundaries of, of dealing with classified information and ongoing investigations and whatnot. But what did this report reveal to the American public that you've encountered as an investigative reporter covering this uh, uh, organization, if you can call them that, this, this gang of liars, as they certainly look like from a read of the Mueller report. What's that been like? And what do we now know about what it's like for those of you who cover them? 
Nicole, it, I, I hate to say it this way, but you know, it's like deja vu all over again for me. <laughs> I, I mean, in some ways, there's breathtaking detail about things that we didn't know were being discussed inside the Oval Office, but we had a clue about, you know, clue A and clue B, but we didn't know the dialogue that went along with it. So, for example, it, it just brings me back immediately to uh, July and August of 2017 when the press shop for the White House was insisting to us that it was not true that the president had dictated a statement from Air Force One. He never dictated a statement, we were told. Uh, indicating in any way uh, how his son should answer a question about the Trump Tower meeting with a Russian lawyer. The president now, you know, we, we reported at the time that he was telling people a false story about this campaign event, except he was putting his lies in the mouth of his son. And we were told absolutely not, the president didn't do this. Well. Robert Mueller makes it clear that we were right, and it's it's sort of shocking the degree to which uh, the president told people over and over again, make this story up, go tell the press this is what happened, and then later when it comes out that that's a lie, um, you know, no one apologizes or says that they lied. Peter, I want to dive into the specifics and, and, and pick up this thread from Carol Lenning, because um, that they lie is something that those of us who cover them and call them and ask them questions and then are left with their responses to somehow weigh against the facts that have been unearthed and uncovered from other places have encountered you much more than me and, and your colleagues who've, who've covered this investigation probably more than anybody. But, but these are, these are um, lies that were exposed in the Mueller report. The rationale for fire and examined by Robert Mueller, the rationale for firing Comey, the efforts to remove special counsel Robert Mueller from his post, the efforts to lie about uh, removing Mueller, the, the elaborate campaign to get McGahn to knock down a story written by your colleagues, Peter, the efforts to obtain Hillary Clinton's emails, the reason for that Trump Tower meeting that Carol Lennig is talking about, uh, the president's involvement in the Trump Tower meeting statement that Carol's also talking about, business dealings in Russia campaign contacts with Russians. Just just talk a little bit more about um, all of the coverage that is cited in the actual Mueller report, not any of it refuted by a 22-month investigation. The only thing revealed is that the liars are the people in the Oval Office and around him. Yeah, I think that's what's really interesting about the report is that all of these journalistic accounts we've had over the last two years by Carol and her colleagues at the Post, by my colleagues at the Times and by other uh, good journalists around town, including at NBC, I think largely have been, uh, you know, uh, validated here. There's, there's uh, time after time episode revealed by Robert Mueller that matches things that have been written about. The difference here is we no longer have to worry about anonymous sources because the sources are right there. They're mm. FBI interviews, mm -hmm. contemporary, uh, contem contemporaneous notes, emails, text messages, all collected by uh, a prosecutor with subpoena power and put together in a way that's, uh, that's hard to refute. What you see the president today doing is kind of lashing out at those who take notes, uh, but he's not actually disputing, uh, you know, any specific instance in the report because, in fact, there is an accumulation of evidence that Robert Mueller has presented that's hard to uh, hard to dispute. Can we just hit pause and, and, and just celebrate this moment as another norm obliterated? This is now a human being who is the president of the United States attacking the practice of taking notes, which is a practice that everyone, I mean, I, I take notes in my house to remember what I have to do. Uh, most people in a White House take notes to remember what a president said. This is a president so offended by someone keeping a record of him. It raises all sorts of questions about his state of mind, about his own conduct, Peter. Well, yeah, look, I mean, it is, it is fair to say that other administrations have tried to avoid taking written records of some things because they, they knew that anything that they wrote down would have to be kept as a Presidential Records Act, could eventually come out, could be subpoenaed by Congress. It's not the first time that the idea of writing things down in a White House is sensitive. But the way the president puts it here in this tweet suggests that he didn't like it because it became, uh, you know, uh, testimony against him, in effect. I mean, it, it validated the stories that 
Don McGahn and other White House aides were telling uh, Robert Mueller because they were able to point down to pieces of paper where they had written things down at the time uh, that they were said. A note taken at the time is always more powerful than somebody's post facto recollection. So any prosecutor, any reporter, any author looks for those kinds of documents because they, they are, uh, they're like gold in terms of trying to uh, reconstruct events that happened uh, weeks, months, and years earlier. Carol Lennig, the uh, report on notes uh, has this uh, interaction. The president asks, what about these notes? Why do you take notes? Lawyers don't take notes. I never had a lawyer who took notes. Don McGahn responded that he keeps notes because he's a real lawyer. And <laughs> explained that notes, I want to write this movie, and explain that notes create a record and are not a bad thing. Then the president said, well, I've had a lot of great lawyers like Roy Cohn. He didn't take notes. Um, Carol. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a nice softball for me, Nicole. I'll just say that um, what the portrait that comes across about this um, White House counsel, Don McGahn, is of a guy constantly a blinking going are you kidding me is it really what you're saying um, and the portrait that comes across of the president frankly is as Peter and his colleagues have so beautifully documented today you know the culture of dishonesty is of a president who's behaving the same way in the White House as he did on the 26th floor of Trump Tower yeah. when it's really like a family business he likes to to interview or talk to people one-on-one -on -one so nobody can claim that they know what he what he said he li he doesn't like groups of people where everybody can recall exactly what was what was um, discussed. He he likes to separate people. He likes to say, this is the story, everybody, right? This is how it went, mm -hmm. which is usually indicative for most prosecutors of somebody who's trying to shape the story, somebody who's trying to get everybody to sing from the same hymnal book. And that's something else, Nicole, that's in Mueller's report. Um, although he wasn't able to pierce the, the attorney-client privilege of the real lawyers that, that pre the president was relying on, it, it looks like the president conscripted some of those attorneys to help him pressure and threaten and get other people to, to not contradict his account of events and to shape their story in a way that was most flattering to him. Another you know, big pillar of obstruction. The amazing thing about the president trying to make things look better for himself is today he's tweeting out all this lunacy that confirms the worst scenarios about himself, pushing back, calling calling the behavior about himself bullshit. I mean, the idea that I had more decorum than what's in there, it was, I mean, who, who says that when they're trying to say I was better than the thug depicted in the obstruction part of the report? After, by the way, he said that it's a report of exoneration. I mean, in fact, the irony... <laughs> He's been on six right? sides yeah. of the exonerated, yeah. not exonerated Now, question. I'm not a lawyer, but the whole narrative is a, is a narrative of obstruction to me, right? The fact that, that um, Mr. Mueller is such a Boy Scout about this and agonized about whether there was obstruction, then the narrative gives chapter and verse of obstruction. It's like a Bob Woodward book, right? I mean, in the sense that he was a little too circumspect about that, I, I think, by the way. I'm going to also take you to mildly to task about something. You, one of my pet peeves is you use this word in the introduction, which I try to purge from the Trump world, meddling in our election. The Russians did not meddle in our election. Too soft. They did an act of cyber warfare against the foundation of our democracy. They I stand attacked corrected. Us. You're okay. right. Don't so, do that again. Yeah. I won't. <laughs> Friday no, afternoon and wait, Rick but, is in scolding but now, let's, Meddling is out. But, but let me just come back to you on that because it's, it's a good correction. I mean, th this was a, a Trump ally and a longtime Republican who said the most stunning thing 24 hours later is that a single, not a single Republican has embraced just the Russia content. And as far as he knew, there was not a single principals meeting scheduled at the White House to delve into the conduct of an American adversary on our democracy, which was... Well, and there's absolute unanimity with people whose I Cues in three figures and actually are honorable about the Russians attacking our election. All of the intelligence community, uh, every right thinking person, it's absolutely indisputable. And in fact, the first sentence of the Mueller report is about the extensive scale of the attack against us. I mean, to me, the thing we have to figure out, even apart from Donald Trump, is what do we do about this 
going forward. And it's happening right now. It's happening every day. We talked mm -hmm. about it before. I mean, right now, there are Russian trolls attacking all of our mm -hmm. Twitter accounts. They're being invented every day at the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. That is still a functioning proposition. Joyce, it was so abundantly clear and it was hard to read. I, I read more of it last night than I was able to read um, before I came on the air this hour yesterday. But it was so abundantly clear and, and, and I was told by, by current and, and past Justice Department officials that all that Mueller was doing was investigating and prosecuting crimes. He wasn't writing a book report. This wasn't, this wasn't as Barr suggested, evidence on both sides of the obstruction question. This was evidence of obstruction, attempted obstruction of justice. And this was reliance on an OLC memo that said you can't indict a sitting president. Did I miss anything? No, I think you're dead on the money. You know, this was um, not what Attorney General Barr presented it as in his uh, precursor press conference. This was what prosecutors do. They write memos that document the facts and how those facts are applied to the law in order to justify their prosecutive decisions. Do you prosecute? Who do you prosecute? What for? And if not, why not? And Mueller laid out that roadmap, I think, with surprising clarity. I know a lot of people feel really unsatisfied or unhappy about what we saw yesterday. I'm not in this camp. I think that there's a very clear picture here of the evidence that, that Mueller put together, and it is strong evidence, even though he believes he is not the correct person to bring obstruction charges. But I have to say one thing, not as a lawyer, but just as a mom. And a, and a step back as I read the report and saw lie after lie, confirmed lies, mounting lies, the president, the people around him. And you know, as, as a parent, one of the most important things that you do is you teach your kids to be truthful. And a part of that in this country has always been looking up to the people that are in charge. Yeah. Suddenly we can't do that. And, and so back to your comment about the fact that there's no principles meetings, nothing going on in the Republican Party. Where is the outrage over what we saw yesterday? One thing we can't take as new information is Donald Trump lying. I, I mean, that's just, <laughs> there's been 10,000 of them. So the fact that he was lying any step of the way is a given. And that my concern with it is he has normalized so much. Imagine if this dropped, if we didn't know any of this, and ranging from the Russians interfered, Trump knew it, he didn't care, um, and they and he was meddling with them, and then he tried to interfere with them with the investigation. All the above, everybody's hair would be on fire. My concern is it's baked in on both sides. I, I felt the report is, ended where it was going to be. There was not going to be this one silver bullet. I think there was a lot of learned helplessness from Democrats. Oh, the Mueller report's are coming, the Mueller report's are coming, and it's going to change the world. I think what we saw was more color, more depth, the things we kind of already knew. I know we're going oh, to God. I felt that way until I started reading it, Donnie. I, I have to push back. I think when you, you look at, you read the first first 27 pages of the obstruction report, and it is a, it is taking a criminal lens to what you described. I mean, we know the behavior, and we also know his hair is a mess and he's overweight. That is baked in. That is who he is. But when you start reading about how he functions as America's sitting president, it may not have a, a, a I mean, I, I'm not arguing with you on cause and effect. I think 40% okay, doesn't, doesn't, yeah, doesn't care, 60% right. is deeply alarmed. But in terms terms of contextualizing how he's functioning as the nation's sitting president. That, that surprised you? I guess that's my it point. It shocked me. I, I, it floored I guess maybe me. I, I guess page I know after that. page I, after I, there's page. There's nothing, I, and I was, the other night, interesting enough, right after was with Michael Cohn, and we were both saying, you know, like, duh, this is him. This is, I, I guess I, I am so in this guy. No, no, Jaden, just, I understand this animal, this beast that's there, that to me it was like, yeah, uh, there was, and as I said, so for me at least, it's so normalized, and hopefully I'm at the very end of the spectrum, but I'm, I'm not saying that. You're not, not you're one of the most upset people I know. I, as I, a dad, no, I, I am beyond upset, but there was nothing in there that was surprising or shocking. I'm gonna call you tonight when I'm reading it and reading okay. to you out loud. Let's, let's, let's just say that Donnie is on the far end of uh, people who understand, know things about Donald Trump because of his well, with Michael Cohen and so on. Uh, uh, there are two things about it that I think are super striking on one level, right? Well, the first is that as, as we step away from the day, a day having with the day reflection yeah. and having read the whole thing now and really kind of absorbed it. One is that we've talked about. Uh, Peter was talking about a couple things. One was like the it's like a Bob Woodward book. Uh, you know, we've all I've I've read all those Me books, too. every book, right? It's the best book as a Correct. picture of just as a novel, as a, as a piece of nonfiction narrative. What's the White House like? What's Donald Trump like as a That's picture? Right. Forget about the legal issues. Just as a picture of what is the functioning White House over the course of the last two years, the picture it paints is vivid and incredibly well 
uh, established, uh, the, the, the proof is there in a way that no journalist could ever get because we don't have subpoena power, and it gives you a crystalline picture of just how much chaos and evil, and I say evil in a very particular way. The president, it is a picture of a guy trying systematically over and over again at a bunch of friends to commit crimes. Sometimes he's successful in doing things that seem criminal to like a normal person. Forget about Mueller's standards, just like, you know, you look at it, you're like, this guy's just trying to commit crimes himself or get other people to commit crimes on his behalf over and over and over again. Sometimes people refuse to help him. Sometimes their incompetence keeps them from committing the crime. But that is a kind of an amazing thing to see the president on these two fronts, on the obstruction front and to, to the, on the, the, the Russia front broadly defined. And the other thing is that it just is a, it, the, the other amazing thing is the thing that Peter mentioned a second ago, which is that in the course of our careers, we've seen so many White Houses where the rule has become, you don't take notes because it will expose you to criminal liability or gets you sucked into something. You're going to have to pay lawyers forever. In this White House, you see over and over again these people taking notes because of the fact that they're trying to protect themselves because what's happening around them is so crazy and they recognize in the moment that it is potentially poses legal jeopardy that they're doing the thing that every White House aide is taught not to do. Don't record everything because eventually that'll get subpoenaed. These guys are like, you know what, this is so messed up that I have to make a record for the file. I have to make a record, a note someplace, because I'm almost certainly going to end up in legal jeopardy, and this is the only way I'm going to save myself. Just that, is, that is off the charts of anything, and we I, probably, I, you know, I have that, one follow-up, because you've, you've written a couple of yeah. uh, pretty vivid, pretty compelling um, narrative accounts, um, and short of subpoena power, I, I would argue you got more than, than, than most people get in terms of painting those pictures. What stood out the most for you? You. I mean, again, just now we go into the realm, and I don't want to trivialize this, but in the realm of, the, of a script writer, I mean, the scene, that scene, the first scene, the, you know, my presidency is over, I'm effed, right? The slumping back in the chair. First of all, really nicely written. The prose is incredible. But, <laughs> but, but beyond that, and that will be in the miniseries. Whatever happens over the next two to six years, that will be in the miniseries about Donald Trump's presidency. But it's also the most revealing moment because it's vivid, but it's also the moment where you realize that Donald Trump confronted with the possibility, now the fact, of a, of a, of a rigorous, fair, fact-based inquiry, he says, my presidency is over. That is the ultimate expression of consciousness of guilt. He knows everything he's yeah. done. Just he's now being investigated. He's like, I'm, I'm cooked because they're all, they're, what I've done is going to come out, so therefore my presidency is dead. That's the predicate for all the obstruction of justice. Everything else that flows from that Absolutely. is that he recognized that he has to somehow shut this thing down because if everything comes out in the public, he's going to be over. I just really want to add on to the evil part, and I've said this on the show, whatever you can imagine a human doing on the evil side, he's capable of. So that's why this stuff, and I'm telling you this, and and... The, the level, the depths that this man is capable of doing, that to me, this was sprinkles. And I'm just being honest. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.